A very warm welcome to OmniFocus Workflows with Mike Burke, and many thanks to all of you who are joining here live today, and uh, look forward to a really, really interesting session with Mike. I know he has a, a lot to, to share. Um, and if you're watching a recording of this, then uh, welcome as well, and I hope you find this, this very useful. And just before I hand it over to Mike, I want to welcome you to Learn OmniFocus. Uh, if you're new to this, this membership-based site, um, it's one that was first established back in June 2014. And at the time, I didn't know if there was going to be enough interest in a site that focuses around OmniFocus, but uh, it's been very successful over the years, and we've continued to grow our global community, had people join from 88 countries at this point. And it's been uh, really great to meet uh, at least some of you through our, our live sessions. And the, the goal from the beginning is to support you in living a fulfilling and productive life uh, with some help from OmniFocus. And something I discovered early on is uh, OmniFocus really is, is an important part of people's productivity system, but it's really only one component. And we, we need to look at OmniFocus in the context of all of the the other apps that you're using. So Learn OmniFocus has grown to be more than just OmniFocus. Uh, the one thing we all have in common is we all use OmniFocus and also showing uh, how it interacts with uh, many other different apps and services. So uh, the session we're going through now is one of the Learn OmniFocus live sessions that really encourages uh, a live sort of community feel within the uh, within the Learn Omni Focus community, and I just want to briefly talk about the different components of Learn Omni Focus Live. Uh, first of all, we uh, sometimes cover specific productivity themes, talk about kind of the productivity approaches and how Omni Focus and other apps can play a, a role in putting those into practice. And I'll be talking about one of those upcoming sessions in just a moment. Uh, we also have featured apps. So we've featured apps like uh, Drafts and, and DevonThink and MindNode, uh, Sauna is a web-based app, and uh, just showed how they can complement and interact with OmniFocus. So we've got many, many more of those in the, the works so that I'll be, be uh, showcasing next year. Uh, we often have workflow guests on. We've had many over the years, and um, it gives a different perspective into how people are using these, these tools in different professions and cultures and parts of the world and life circumstances and things like that to really help it to be as relevant as possible. And then uh, lastly, we have the small group office hour sessions. And this is one of my favorite aspects of the site uh, because I get to, to meet you um, in the small group. There's a limit of 10 people for each of these sessions. And you can come with anything OmniFocus related that you'd like to discuss, maybe some, some areas where you're stuck, some features you don't quite understand. Um, maybe just want to come and uh, meet some other OmniFocus users, and you're very welcome either way as well. So a little taste of what's coming soon, and there's really a lot brewing for, for 2022, and this will give you a taste of what's coming down the pike. Uh, the next live session is going to be on January 26th uh, next year. And uh, this is one I'm really excited about and one where I think it probably applies to most, if not all, all people where you have ideas and maybe you don't know quite where to keep those ideas, how to keep track of them. Maybe you sort of get an idea and start acting on it uh, right away and you find you have just too many things going on all at once. So this session is really going to dive into those topics. So how do you capture your ideas in a systematic way? How do you classify them so that you can, can find them again? And uh, I'll talk a lot about uh, this, this term and this pr practice I call incubating, where you're taking that seed of an idea and not necessarily doing anything with it, um, not necessarily committing to doing anything with it at least, but you're kind of playing with it, it's you're kind of taking it into uh, sort of the, the sandbox and saying, okay, what could this become uh, without sort of the pressure of deadlines and, uh, and delivering something specific. So we'll talk about the sort of the whole sort of idea workflow and the, the roles that uh, OmniFocus plays along the way. So really looking forward to that session in January. Uh, there's currently uh, four more office hour sessions uh, this year. So there's two, two more this month in November. 
uh, two in December, and then I just opened three more for January. And I've tried to vary the, the time of these. So uh, regardless of where you live in the world, hopefully you can find uh, a date and time that works. And if you would like to come to these and you're not finding that it's fitting into your schedule, uh, definitely let me know and I'll see what I can do to accommodate. As I mentioned earlier, uh, I've talked a lot about using OmniFocus with other apps over the years, and I've taken a particularly deep dive on some of them, uh, specifically Asana, DevonThink, Drafts, and MindNode. So these all have content that's dedicated to these specific apps and how to interact with these uh, with, with OmniFocus. And I've got many more of these that are currently in various stages of development. Um, some of these are ones that I use, use daily, uh, ones like uh, Craft and Daylight, and um, other ones um, I'm in touch with people who are using these daily and who have been using them for years. So uh, stay tuned for some of these, these sessions coming out uh, uh, as we go into the new year. And if there's any apps that you'd like me to cover that aren't on the list, I'm very open to ideas as well. So if you wanted me to really shine the spotlight on uh, OmniFocus Plus, your productivity app of choice. Uh, if you could drop me a line, that would be great. As many of you probably know, there's a major update to OmniFocus, OmniFocus 4, which is in development. And i am uh, been uh, involved in providing feedback and doing testing since the very early days of OmniFocus 4. And the, the team are very hard to work on this. They're making some some great progress, and I'm looking forward to having some OmniFocus content, OmniFocus 4 content ready to go as soon as the uh, the app launches. So definitely stay tuned for, for details on that. And uh, lastly, something I've uh, committed to doing over the years is to supporting our, our global community, to helping uh, people all over the world have access to uh, to what they need to be happy and have contribution to life. And I choose a different charity to support each year. And I'm very happy to be supporting UNICEF um, uh, this year. So keep an eye out for some information on the uh, contributions that will be made later in the month uh, around Giving Tuesday. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy to be uh, supporting UNICEF. All right, well, without uh, further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Mike Burke. And uh, just to share a little bit about Mike um, before I hand over the uh, the mic to him. Uh, so he lives in Bel, Bel Air, Maryland, which is uh, not too far from Baltimore. And uh, one of the first places I learned about uh, Mike was through his website and blog, which is themikeburke.com. And he's got a very active blog there where he talks a lot about uh, OmniFocus and automation, and he'll be... Uh, Definitely uh, delving into those topics today. Um, specifically, we're going to be looking at automation using drafts, Hazel, and Keyboard Maestro. And these are some of my favorite apps, uh, ones that I've been using for many years. So I'm really looking forward to learning some some new ways to uh, to really leverage the the capabilities that they have. Uh, if you want to learn more about this beyond what we're covering this session, I highly recommend subscribing to Mike's blog. And you can go to youtube.com forward slash Mike Burke Tech. And I'll also include a link with the uh, recording as well. And you can also uh, follow Mike on Twitter at here Mike Burke. All right. So uh, I'll hand it over to you at uh, this point, Mike. Thank you so much, Tim, for that introduction and for developing the community that you have that um, is so evident here today, uh, talking to everybody when we we're joining the call earlier was uh, really interesting just to see how far and wide people are coming from to your to your website uh, and and joining in the community um, today. Uh, I is kind of a, a big deal for me. I couldn't sleep very well last night because I'm so excited to be here and be with you guys. Because uh, in my product productivity journey, uh, which I'm going to talk about here, is um, you know. A long time coming. <laughs> I should have done it a lot earlier, but uh, I've only really been purposeful about this for about the past 10 years. Um, once I started teaching, it really became something that I needed to do uh, to, to keep teaching, you know what I mean? Uh, in a very informal way of citing my sources, uh, I'll just throw out there a couple of things that have informed me uh, on my journey. Um, 
I'm very much a synthesizer. I like, I, I like to find things from lots of different places and put them together. And here are some of the most important places um, where I've received that information, including Learn OmniFocus. A lot of these things are going to be very similar, very familiar uh, to you guys. Mike was even wearing a, a automator's t-shirt. So um, you guys probably know about most of these sources, but I just want to show you kind of what's informing my opinion um, and, and where I'm getting my ideas from. I don't want you to think that these are new things or things that I'm claiming originality uh, about, but I will point out that um, probably the three things that come out of this uh, collection of sources for me that are kind of guide me on a day-to-day -day basis are that I really enjoy um, and find the most value from experiential uh, learning. I don't want to read a lot about um, how to make a blog. I want to read some about how to make a blog, but then I want to start doing it because that's how I'm going to learn. That's how I find the questions that I didn't know I should be asking. <laughs> and and um, that's really informed a lot of what I've done here. And then through that experience, I'm going to learn new things. And I really want to capture that learning um, and use that learning to build out checklists and automations that help me do better next time. My first blog post was awful. My second one was also awful. My third one may have been a little bit better, right? But that's the whole point is I'm going to learn from what I've done. And then um, hopefully by capturing that learning, I'm going to get better over time. And I really do not trust my brain. That's the other third thing about this process, which obviously is a very big getting things done mentality, but um, probably the the single source on this page that, that had the biggest impact on me was the Checklist Manifesto. And this is a book that I don't see a ton um, coming. I don't see coming up a lot in productivity circles, maybe because I joined productivity circles after this book came out. But uh, the Checklist Manifesto is probably the, the single most impactful um, you know, book or, or source of information for me uh, in my productivity and probably even in like my life and job, um, just that the concepts are struck me, I guess, at the right time, the right, uh, the right author. Atul Gawande is you know, a really good writer and just his story and how he, how he presented all this information really hit home for me. And that's what really drives me a lot of times with the creation of checklists and automations are, are the lessons that originally started uh, from the checklist manifesto. And then the other concept of probably the only person on here that might not be um, obvious to, to the majority of people here is uh, the gentleman in the top right corner of that uh, my grid here. Uh, that's Don Norman, and he's considered to be the founder of design thinking. And I'm not quite sure who my audience is here, so I don't know if you've heard of that term before, but uh, that's the other thing that's kind of really that just the, a loose general concept of design thinking being the cyclical iteration, always trying something new, even if it's, I'm not hundred percent sure it's going to work, trying it, seeing if it does and, and moving from there and, and going to the next thing uh, that has that concept, uh, which loosely can be de described as design thinking, I think is another huge part of um, how I go through the day and how I look at problems. And I said earlier that my, Productivity journey started in about 10 years ago. I guess I'm rounding up a little bit there, but I first downloaded the app To Do on January 5th, 2013. It was a New Year's resolution. It was my second year of teaching. I was a public high school science teacher for 10 years. Uh, this was, like I said, year 1.5 for me when I bought the book and then, or sorry, bought this app. And then over the next five years, I just so happened to, not purposefully, but uh, to go through uh, the apps on the screen here. I used um, uh, something called the secret weapon, which was a way of using Evernote to create a productivity system. Um, I used a personal Kanban board on Trello um, and I used things for a little while, but things was too nice to me. Um, it, it wasn't as obvious that I had missed something. Uh, so I didn't do very well with things. And I ended up coming to OmniFocus in 2018. And while I've definitely played around with some apps, uh, you know, looking at Notion or other things like that, uh, nothing has 
caused me to delete and restart a productivity system uh, since I found OmniFocus. Just to give a quick rundown of my teaching career, this is really an example of why I needed a uh, productivity system. Because as a teacher, uh, on the left side of this little mind map is my family, uh, personal stuff. And then the right side were the things you know outside of teaching uh, and other things that came up uh, in that job that I needed to keep track of. And these are just the things that happened every year. There would always be you know, field trips or assemblies or other things that came up that required a lot of other support. But the, my job as a teacher was really complicated and complex. And so uh, as I've switched to the job of a um, technical trainer, a corporate technical trainer, I did that uh, in July of this year, just a few months ago, um, my, my workload has lightened considerably. Uh, so I've really enjoyed that, but it has led to a, a, I don't want to say a ground up rewrite of my productivity system, but I'm certainly iterating right now. Like I've talked about uh, being a, a tenant of my productivity. Uh, there's a major shift happening right now. So I'm sharing with you my current uh, you know, one eighteen p.m. Eastern time. <laughs> like this is this is how things run for me right now, and this is you know all the decisions and things of the past eight years have have led to this point. But you know, next next week, next month, things might be different. But but I'm happy with where things are right now. And the one last thing I'll I'll put up on the screen here before I switch over to my OmniFocus setup is that I do um, I have run a defer date based system. And I have run a due date based system. Um, but neither one of those worked for me over the years of using OmniFocus, uh, but I still use them. They just don't mandate how my system runs. So I do use defer dates for things like habits, chores, and the start dates of things or when I would like to do something but not everything in my system has a defer date. I do think about when something goes in my system, I think about if it needs a defer date. Uh, and I've tried using habit tracking apps. I've done streaks. I've done momentum. I used Notion for a little while to try to do that. Uh, but I just find that it needs to be an OmniFocus for me to do it. So um, habits are in there and chores, things I, you know, doing the laundry, filling the dog's water, <laughs> you know, that type of stuff is is in OmniFocus as well. And when something becomes available, which is obviously the classic definition of a defer date. Um, so I use those for, um, for my tasks and I use due dates only when there is a repercussion if I don't do it, right? I got burned by using deferred date or sorry, due dates as when I would like to get something done as opposed to something that needs to be done. So defer dates are exclusively repercussions. And I have a QR code here. I have a post on my website um, called the anatomy of an action item uh, as a former anatomy teacher. I guess I just <laughs> went with that. Um, so you can scan that and get a little further depth about how I think about action items. I use this perspective um, called today, which is very similar to um, what you would see uh, the forecast perspective which I used to use as a main driver of my system at one point, but I ended up making the today perspective uh, because I liked the idea that I could make this go away. Like I could, I could get, I could be done as opposed to having that infinite list that's in forecast. And it also gives me a little bit more control over how I want to have tasks shown to me. So this is very, very similar to a forecast. It might even be, you might be able to click options and forecast to set the, exactly this thing up but um, I am attending the event. So I will go ahead and check that off the list. Um, but my today task, uh, these are things that are available and they are due soon, which for me is 24 hours. Um, they are flagged, it's, it's any of these things. They're due within the next 24 hours, they're flagged they have a defer date or they have this word grind, <laughs> which is the tag that I picked for, you know, the daily grind, like something I want to, um, I want to get done, but because of the, the sorting here, uh, what really, what it ends up doing is 
things that are due today get clumped to the top, regardless of the um, actual time. So it's not like in a forecast or it's all laid out chronologically. Everything that's due is put up top. Anything that has a defer date. Um, so it's a habit that I'm trying to do. Like I got to do better at calling my dad. So there's a defer date in here, uh, a, a task, like a, a habit for me to try to do. Uh, but you can see that I deferred it and I haven't done it since the third. I, that's when I wanted to do it. So I'm a little bit behind on that. But because it has the um, oldest defer date, it gets put to the top. So in my mind, due dates, things, these are things that need to happen today um, because, again, there's a repercussion if not. And then defer date uh, are things that I would like to do today. Um, maybe I skip them a couple of days, but I would like to do them, but they're on the list uh, and available here. And then the sorting is just a nice little kind of like nudge that the first thing I see is called that. I'm like, damn it, I got to do that. Uh, so I have things on here like take vitamin, which I have already done today, uh, but we're going to do a little demo with that later. So I'm going to mark it. I'm going to show you an automation for that later. Um, working out, which I have not yet done today, but I need to do. Uh, and then some work tasks show up. Like, so there's a training that I have to work on an outline, a content outline on. So I want to work on that every day for 30 minutes until it's done. Cause it's a big, long task. Um, and this fake invoice, which, um, if you haven't figured out is fake and it's just a demo that we're going to do today. And then I have this blog post that uh, I want to do called make meetings matter. Um, and I have that tagged as grind because that's something I want to get done. If I, it's on my list and it's reminding me to try to do it, but it's, there's no bad thing that happens. There's no deferred date. There's no due date. It's just, I need to do it because I'm a little bit behind on writing blog posts. So that's today. I really like today. Um, and then I have uh, one over here called Frogs uh, from the four hour work week is when I first got this concept of um, the, I can show you what that looks like over here too. Um, if the, the misattributed Mark Twain quote, that's if you, the first thing you do every morning is eat a live frog, then the rest of your day is really easy or something along those lines. So frogs for me are tasks that are available and they have a high impact and high energy tag. Uh, so there's two different tags there. So I tag all of my items with the impact that they will have. If it's a high impact task, uh, you know, big, important type thing that's going to help somebody else do something. I can share my definitions of them. Um, that's an important thing. I'd really like to try to get done. High energy is something that's going to require my absolute focus to do. I can't multitask. I can't get distracted type thing. So um, these are things. A frog is something that is a big, important task, but also needs a lot of my time and effort and energy. Um, so I at the end of every day, I do an automation, which I'll show you later. Uh, and one of the tasks is to pick one or two frogs for tomorrow. Um, so that's forces me to at least think about trying to, to do a lot of, uh, to chip away at this list of very high impact tasks. And then the other tag here, which is called quick wins. Uh, these are tasks that are available uh, that are less than 30 minutes uh, that also have a high impact, but they are low or normal energy. Um, so these are things that I would like to do like in the afternoon, if I wanted to do one more thing before I was done for the day, I could click on this. I also have one of my videos on my YouTube channel is um, about how I use uh, shortcuts to create a custom Pomodoro timer. Uh, so it just looks at, is it the morning? If it is the morning, then show me my frog's perspective in addition to setting up like the timer and playing music and things like that. So if it's AM, open up in OmniFocus, the frog's perspective. If it's PM, open up quick wins. I use that timer a lot more when I was a teacher than I do now. Um, but that's, that's the reason the quick wins and frogs are there is because they help me filter, you know, high impact tasks. And then 
the other area and what I normally think about work in and, and, and organizing things in is uh, projects. So I'm a project uh, folder, nested folder type person. So the um, I have an area, a folder for every area of my life. Inside of that folder, I have a single action list, which I am actively trying to eliminate, right? I'm trying to get done all 44 of these actions. But unfortunately, things keep getting added to it. Somebody's trying to sabotage me. And it's myself. Uh, and uh, chores, which is a much bigger list, these are things that I want to get done. This is not every day. This is some of these things are once a year. Some of these things are once a quarter, once a week, whatever. And some of these things are small, like cleaning. Uh, we have a bunch of hydro flask, like the stainless steel water bottles, and they get funky if you don't clean them. Uh, so every Sunday, I clean everybody's water bottles with, you know, hot water, um, taking out the trash you know, that happens twice a week, but these things, this chores list will never go. Well, very rarely goes down. This is just where I keep all my repeating tasks, but it is as a single action, um, list here. I have folders for some things like we're I'm decorating my office now that I'm working from home and trying to do that type of stuff. So I got a couple more things in there, like buying a paper shredder and getting some things, um, replacing our deck. There's some you know folders to put together some similar projects, um, everybody's birthdays that I need to do stuff for. And then um, I have some projects listed in there as well. And every one of my uh, folders has a single action list and a chores list. If there are folders, then they go there. Otherwise, there are the other projects down here. Um, and that's the same for work, but there are fewer things in work, a uh, few other projects. So there's no subfolders in there. Because I do like to, and you can see I have a bunch of other perspectives. They're not part of my like daily availability list, uh, but I do try to make sure that everything has an, uh, an energy, a time, and an impact. So I have filtered, I have perspectives to help me find and maintain those when I'm doing a good job. There's nothing in there, but sometimes there's not. I don't know what's in there right now, so I'm not going to click on it and uh, undercut my authority on the, on the talk. Uh, but yeah, this is a high impact task and it is either low energy or normal energy. Okay, great. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, just one other question about tags. Do you use kind of some of the classic GTD tags like at home? you know, phone, things like that? Or do you have a more focused on energy levels? Um, well, so I don't, uh, now everything is home <laughs> for me. So I don't use that anymore. Uh, I do have a kind of a who, what, when, where type situation. Uh, that is actually one I don't use anymore. And that automation accidentally put these things on there. I need to update that automation because I don't use those anymore. So I have... Um, what, who, energy, and impact. So uh, who is what you think it is, what um, it are, are things like, you know, chores, a home thing, but I don't use the location tag on that anymore. Uh, I used to have like locations for that, uh, home improvement going on adventures, like family adventures and holidays and things like that. And then energy and impact. So high, high, normal, low, high, normal, low. Uh, so I'll jump into some of the automations. And so I have um, one, two, three, four, five automations that I want to share with you all. Um, and the uh, first one is you know, borderline not an automation, but um, on my Apple Watch, I am a huge fan of the drafts complication. And I am very sad to see on Twitter, um, Agile Tortoise has been talking about uh, an update to the newest version of Watch OS, which makes a, a little wrinkle in this plan, uh, but buy more strawberries. My wife will often, you know, just shout at me <laughs> from the kitchen and tell me, uh, you know, we need to buy, you know, put something on the list, so to speak. So super easy to grab those thoughts there. And the sync is super fast. Um, I guess because I'm on the same network, maybe it's faster or maybe iCloud sync is just that fast, but I love the capturing um, little things like that via the watch. It is a complication that is on every one of my watch faces. Um, 
And I really think that's a, a really powerful way to capture. I do not capture into OmniFocus. Uh, if it is text, if it is a thought, if it is an idea, uh, it goes into drafts. Um, if it's a task for me to do, it goes into OmniFocus, meaning, um, if I, I should say that differently. If I need to do something, I look at OmniFocus to see what I need to do. If I need to be somewhere at a certain time, I look at my calendar. If I need to write something down, it goes to drafts. I don't think about you know where it goes otherwise. So I capture OmniFocus tasks in drafts quite often via the watch. Um, so that was the first one, real simple, easy automation to ease into it. Uh, the next one is also in drafts. And I will switch to my task management perspective. Um, so this task paper stuff is from um, the always excellent Rosemary Orchard. Um, and I just deleted some of the things that I don't use, but I have these two tasks down here, these two actions down here under weekly review. And the first one is brain dump prompts. And so if I click on that or double click on that, I get uh, the, the day's date, but I find this to be a very, very helpful way of capturing. And I will take my iPad and um, run this action on the iPad, or I can run it here and then open it on the iPad. And I will go stand in my garage and I will go look around and see if there's anything I need to do in there. Home is just general home things that aren't necessarily location dependent, but uh, you know, then I go stand in the living room, then I go stand in the kitchen. So this is all ordered <laughs> based on how I walk around the house. Like what's the next room that I'm going to be in. And then um, we have outside, we have the cars, we have uh, family members, work projects, personal projects, et cetera. Um, and then, so I really like using the dictation feature in drafts to just say the task and then say the word new, the phrase new line, and it just drops down in there. So So let's just imagine that I did that. So we have test, testing, and tested. Uh, so I can come back to my computer. I can put drafts on one side. I can put OmniFocus on the other, and I can check to make sure it's not something I've captured before if I want to, uh, and then go through and audit this list. But then I have um, this action, which I got help from uh, the man himself, um, Agile Tortoise, on the drafts um, forums. To make work. So what this action does is it takes everything that does not have a um, Octothorpe in front of it uh, and moves that to OmniFocus for me. So there are my, my actions uh, right in OmniFocus. And sometimes this is one or two things, sometimes this is 20 or 30 things, uh, but also because I um, like to title case things, and I don't know how to write programs <laughs> or to, to code. Um, I found this action. Or actually, I found this action, which title cases everything that's selected. So then I had to go find an action that selects everything. <laughs> and then I used this script that, um, again, uh, Greg Pierce wrote. Um, on the forum for me and then dropped it in there. So this is what does the heavy lifting of moving things um, into OmniFocus for me. It's just do these two things to title case all my actions first. Um, and so that's a great task. That's, that's really helpful way to structure my, um, my weekly reviews or my brain dumps and um, make sure that I'm not capturing too much stuff or I'm not capturing irrelevant things or I'm not forgetting things that I should be capturing because it, it lists out every room in my house that I need to think about and all the different aspects of my um, responsibility. So I find that to be a super helpful uh, action. And I don't need to buy more strawberries because I just did that. So the next thing I'm gonna show you is um, how I use Hazel to automate the completion of some of these tasks. So let me scroll this down a little bit so you can still see the uh, OmniFocus here. But let me switch to my inbox. So my inbox is the uh, it's just a folder that I have in Google Drive. 
And for the most part, I actually run all my automations off of a Mac mini, a headless Mac mini. Um, but I have this action set up here on my computer to show you. So what this is simulating, let's say I have a task of repeating task, a chore um, that would be in my system to download my mortgage statement because I want to have paper. I want to have uh, PDF records of all of my stuff. That's I actually, I do. So I, I want to have my own copy, not on the company's servers. I want to have my own copy of all of them, those types of important bills. Or if I scan something, um, whatever. But I want to make sure that I, I can't do that until you know the 15th of the month or whatever for whatever statement I'm looking for. So this usually has a defer date of the 15th. So when it is the 15th, I just take a second to go download that. And that's an example of a deferred task, a classic deferred task use case. But then I have to go back and you know check it off the list. So I have this fake invoice um, over here that I made, you know, as you can see. And this would be this is the surrogate for what I would do from a normal bill that I'm trying to download. So this gets downloaded to my inbox. Hazel will do its thing. And then, so what it did, my, my project here was just to move it to, if it's a PDF and it had the name contains fake invoice, move that to the desktop. So I put it right back up here so I could show you, but then also run this Apple script and that Apple script completed this task. And scheduled me to do it uh, in a minute. <laughs> this is what I had set up. It, it repeats every minute. So once I completed it, it's going to be available in just a moment. But um, this is super helpful because there's 20 or 30 bills I want to download every month or every year. Or some of them are quarterly or whatever. And so that's helpful to, um, to know that, it, that I've got it, it's good, and it checks it off for me. Um, so I find that to be super helpful to write those, to get the Apple script to do that. Uh, I actually use drafts to do that. So this invoice, if you right click and get uh, copy as link, and then I have this little, um, this is one that I wrote because it doesn't need any coding. Uh, do I have the link on my clipboard? So what I wanna do is delete everything except for that task ID and say yes. Then it writes, it just fills in the blank right there is really what it does. Um, and this is the Apple script that I need to complete this task. And this works because this is a repeating task. So its ID doesn't change over time. Um, if this was a one-off project, it wouldn't work. Um, but if this is something I do every month, then I have this quick little Apple script that will mark it complete. And I can attach that to Hazel to get things done. So that's been really helpful. I just started doing that recently. Quick question on that, uh, Mike. Uh, so yeah. you, I guess you have a different Hazel rule for each repeating action, is that correct? Yeah, and that's yeah. one of the examples of, uh, you know, I made the rule every time it was time to do it. You know, I didn't make 15 rules at once. It was just, oh yeah, I got to download that. So let me make the rule, make the Apple script. And yes, it's tedious, but in, in my mind, it's quick enough and, and cool enough that it's worth my time to do, in my opinion. Yeah, and it's one of those things you do at once, and I'm sure it gets easier and easier the more of these you create, but then you can yeah. kind of set it and forget it and not have to kind of use mental energy to make sure that these things get taken care of. So I actually started doing this because um, I, I couldn't mark complete an OmniFocus task from shortcuts on my phone. So my vitamins in the morning, I put a um, NFC tag on there. So now when I run, I scan that in the morning after I take my vitamin, that saves that action, saves a file to iCloud Drive, which Hazel is watching. And then because this is a habit, does that again. It's not happening on this computer. It's happening on my Mac mini. So it's going to take a second for it to sync, but it's fast enough for me. Cause this is not something, this is not like 
I'm not flying an airplane. <laughs> it's not that fast. I don't need it to be that fast. Um, but this will disappear in just a moment. You can see that running. This is that um, the vitamin shortcut. It logs a bunch of different, you know, all the different health samples um, that are there. And then you scroll past all of that stuff. It logs the water I drank for it, but then it saves a file called vitamin to my shortcuts folder in iCloud Drive. And it marks that. Um, when it does that, again, Hazel's watching and, and we'll mark that complete. And it's gone because it got it synced from my, my uh, Mac Mini. So that idea got me thinking about, you know, well, why don't I, when I download something, why don't I have that autocomplete and so on? And I have something similar happen for workouts. So if I, I have a shortcut that I use to start um, the Streaks workout app and play some music and things like that. And it also does the, um, saves a file called workout and marks this complete. So I remember I check off the list to do that. So just to kind of reinforce that a bit. So Hazel is basically the glue that allows these, the essentially the real world to be reflected in OmniFocus. And uh, yeah, just having a file added somewhere that Hazel's watching is what causes the magic to happen and things to get completed and so forth. Exactly, yeah. yeah. H Hazel, is that's a perfect way of saying it, yep. Yeah, perfect. Uh, just on a side note too, there was an update to Hazel earlier this week and they now have support for shortcuts if you're using um, Mac OS Monterey so that you could have uh, something happen if you drop your your water bill into your uh, inbox that Hazel is watching. It could also use a shortcut to do something in OmniFocus. So I'll definitely uh, look forward to covering that in the future as well. I'm not dem demoing a lot of shortcuts here because I'm still running on uh, Big Sur uh, and iOS 14. I'm not, I haven't shifted over to the newest release yet. So, um, I'm excited to see what shortcuts brings to the Mac and how that can work. But um, honestly, between Hazel drafts and, and Keyboard Maestro, um, I don't know what gap currently exists for me, but it's cool to see uh, shortcuts get added to the, the toolkit. And uh, as, as those other automation apps come in uh, and start integrating with shortcuts, perhaps there's a, a new thing that can be created, which would be super exciting to see what's available then. So I have two more things to show, and these are gonna be the more complicated ones. So I actually recorded these as a video instead of the live demo um, because of that complexity with the recording of everything, computer, a little old. So <laughs> I wanted to make sure these automations worked um, as normal. So this is what I was talking about, the clear to neutral process. Um, when at the end of every day, I run this shortcut. Every meeting, every day has a different meeting at the end of the day. So I don't do it at a set time. Um, I actually have a, uh, I have a shortcut in the morning uh, that, that does a bunch of stuff to prep me for the day. And one of the things that it does is finds my last item on the calendar, adds five minutes, and then adds an OmniFocus task to run my keyboard or my uh, clear to neutral shortcut so that I do that after my last meeting is over. The first thing it does is it pulls a um, task paper template from drafts. It opens up my work email. It opens up my calendar and switches my calendar to the next day. Um, it puts a project in OmniFocus for me to do my clear to neutral routine. So it opens the inbox. It opens my today perspective and it opens my frogs perspective. And then it opens drafts down here in the bottom. And I have, so I have a quadrant of my computer dedicated to each of the important work you know, related things for me to go through and process. So then I clear out my OmniFocus inbox. So I go to the today tab, uh, or, sorry, I'm in the inbox. So I look at anything else that's in the inbox that's not this uh, and make sure that that's organized correctly. I go through all you know, those things that make sense. And then, um, I pick out at least two frogs for tomorrow. And so that's when I go through my frogs list and find two things that fit in with the schedule that I have for tomorrow, what I'm working on and, and what makes sense. And so then I flag those for me, flags are frogs, FF. Um, so I flag two tasks um, 
for me to work on tomorrow. Sometimes it's only one. I say at least two, but that's ambitious. Sometimes it's one. And sometimes like today, well, I guess attending the session is, is a frog for today. So I got one done. But that's the clear to neutral macro. So that's Keyboard Maestro, who, which is running all of that stuff um, and, and does all the management of everything, all the window management, setting up of everything so that I can sit here and, and, and get to work. So that one's pretty cool. But probably my most complex one is called um, SNHS Shortcut. So when I was a teacher, um, I was in charge of the Science National Honor Society. So um, it's a group, obviously, maybe not obviously, I don't know if where, you, where you are from there, these things called honor societies. It's a bunch of smart, nerdy kids, basically, uh, exactly our type of people, probably. Um, but I was the advisor for that. And the goal of that group is to try to get the high school students to run it, to get to teach them productivity, management, leadership skills, that type of stuff. So I had an automation here. And the first thing it did was ask me for um, when the next meeting was. So I would do this at the end of the November meeting. I would run the shortcut with this, with my leadership team there, the, the officers of the club. We would pick a date and then I would run this uh, shortcut it put, would put a general meeting on my personal calendar, my Gmail calendar. So I had that squared away, but also on my school calendar. Um, and then it would subtract seven days from that. So the general meeting would be where all a hundred and some kids would meet together. A week before that, I wanted to meet with the leaders, the officers, like the five kids who are in charge of the club. And so we had a meeting seven days ahead of that. So I had a meeting on my personal calendar and a meeting on my school calendar so that I could invite the students to a Microsoft Teams meeting from my school calendar. And then I had... Um, I know this seems like a lot of meetings, but to, to teach teach high school kids how to, how to do this. A lot of structure needs to be in place. So I taught, um, so then I would meet one-on-one -on -one with the president 10 days before the meeting. So and it would, what ended up being was I'd meet with the president. We would set up the agenda for the leadership meeting. We talk about any problems that we had and figure it all out. Then she would run the leadership meeting with the officers and get it all squared away with them. And I would attend that meeting. And then all of the kids, all of the officers would run the general meeting. And again, I would attend that. So um, this structure really ended up being really helpful for them. Um, and then once all those were on my calendar, I would email the leadership team with the dates we picked and tell them a bunch of other things of the form letter type thing that I had in drafts. And I would send another one to the president that was different with different dates but then that shortcut would run um, and getting all of our emails and, and um, calendar invites all taken care of in seven seconds, you know, really, really quick. But this is about OmniFocus. So if you look at the very beginning task, the very first thing was to create a uh, OmniFocus task telling me to run a keyboard maestro trigger but it had a URL encoded text in there and would add that to the inbox and it's flagged because I had a, um, a pretty complex project here, um, you know, with lots of checkpoints and lots of um, substitutions and replacements for the date variables and things like that. So this, when I tried to run this in shortcuts it would crash. So I have to run this heavy, complex task paper text replacement type shortcut um, or project creation. I had to do that on the Mac. Uh, so I was able to figure out how we can run a keyboard maestro trigger from a URL, but by using the trigger value, which is that URL encoded text here. So by clicking this one button, this shortcut ran in the background. And even though it says prompt user for input, I didn't need to, like, it, it was all in there. Um, I didn't have to type anything. I could just click the 
click the OK button. It was already pre-filled in. Um, and then this OmniFocus would grind for a second while it while that stuff got dropped in there, and then it would be it would be good. But if I tried to run the shortcut on the um, on an iPad, even an iPad Pro, it, it wouldn't work. It would it would uh, fail more often than it would be successful. So I just had to shunt this little part of the process over to OmniFocus. But then this was all you know dates. So the date minus fifteen days is when this project got started. And then the date minus 14 days is when I would confirm that this was all working and everybody was coming and, and that type of stuff. So then there was a bunch of other calculations out because of, um, because of the work here. And then the very last thing, actually the second to last thing, is updating the task paper template in drafts for these meetings. All these automations, I'm always running them. I'm always trying to think of, all right, so what's, what didn't work? What's changed? What could get better? So I have a dedicated action item in the project to make the automation better. And then the very last thing was to run the automation for the next month. So that's me making sure that the automate, that we set up next month's meeting. So this is on the day of the meeting plus a day, actually. If you're not clear what task paper is, I thought it'd be useful just to take a moment to to explain that. And the, the way I would define it is it's really just a way of expressing projects and actions in a text format. If you've ever used Markdown where you can like do like uh, headings and bold and links and things like that, it's essentially the equivalent, but for tasks and actions. So it might look a little complex on the surface, but all it is is text really. And then you just need to have a different way of expressing this is a due date or this is a tag or this is an estimated duration and things like that. Yeah, I apologize for not pointing that out before. Yeah, thank you, Tim. That's that is a um, an, another succinct example of how that works or of, of what that is, and that's where I got the OmniFocus. This is again from Rosemary Orchard. She has an action group in drafts that that helps you um, write this. So if you have a you want to put a due date in there, then you can, you know, click do, and then it puts in the text for you. And then you just say when you want it to be due. So again, that was the most complex automation. So I apologize if I didn't prepare you enough for that one, but that, that automation pulls a lot of trigger, pulls a lot of things together, um, but sets up, you know, 50 or 60 things that need to happen or, and, and make sure that everything goes on without me having to think about it. Well, I should say with me having to think about it for two or three minutes at the end, thinking through everything and making sure it all worked and then clicking the button to, to run it again next time. So these, these are the types of things I talked about at the beginning that I find super helpful as uh, capturing learning and then using checklists to um, and, and automations to help me um, not have to do it in my brain, right? I capture the learning and it's, it's, very securely saved so that the next time I can, I don't lose any ground. I start cl closer to the finish line and next month I'll be even closer to the finish line theoretically uh, than I was this month because I'm going to learn something new and I'm going to add it into the automation. I'm going to make it a little bit better. I just want to so, underline a couple of things that Mike's sharing there. First of all, I think the act of automating things forces us to look at what is actually happening here, what needs to happen, what is the timing, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's useful just in the fact of thinking through systematically. Um, and then as, as Mike was saying, this really comes back to the checklist manifesto, which is one of my favorite books as well, it is even if things don't go, you know, quite as well as they could have, Having a checklist, or in this case, uh, modifying the task paper is a nice way of having that learning applied to the future so that uh, that thing isn't forgotten or it's done at a more appropriate time or whatever. So there's this whole iter iterative process that takes place that not only saves you time uh, ultimately, but gives you better results when all is said and done. And that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm with OmniFocus. Um, is because the uh, the task paper support, the automation support, the uh, you know depth and complexity of, of uh, what's available is, is something that I wasn't able to find 
elsewhere in my productivity um, path and my history. Um, and so OmniFocus being able to support task paper, um, being able to support and, and having keyboard maestro pull from drafts and, you know, drop things in like that, that whole, how all that works together is, um, is something that's, you know, got me hooked, uh, on, on OmniFocus, on, on drafts, on, um, keyboard maestro, Hazel, all, all the things are, uh, all those things connect together in such a harmonious way that, uh, it's really, really hard to imagine me using anything else at this point. And if you want to learn more about uh, using uh, task paper, there's a using OmniFocus with drafts course. And we actually get into more detail on the syntax of task paper and, and how you could create a template of a project in drafts. Um, um, and then what Mike is showing today is essentially an extension of that. So um, it's one of those things start with something simple. Maybe you just doing one task in drafts and seeing how it shows up in uh, OmniFocus and that'll work on the iPhone, iPad and Mac. And then you can gradually start to, to take those skills and develop them. And I think you'll, uh, you'll find it pays very hands handsome dividends, both in terms of the times it saves you and the, the, the fact you're not likely to, you know, kind of fall down the same, same traps over and over again. And then the app for NFC tags, I just use shortcuts. So shortcuts lets you do a personal automation in shortcuts. And then you just scan, um, scan the, the blank NFC tag. There's nothing special about this. Um, and those are, if you don't have NFC tags, you can get them on somewhere like Amazon. They're, they're very inexpensive now. Yeah. Uh, it's worth pointing out to probably carry NFC tags around with you all the time. So if you have a, a credit card that has a built-in NFC tag. And so you can actually use your credit card to trigger an automation on your iPhone. So you could say, every time I tap my credit card to my iPhone, it's going to launch my banking app. Or um, I've used one in the past where I've got a transit card that I tap when I get on the bus or the train, and that has an NFC. So I can just tap it to my phone and that'll open up the, uh, the transit app, which will say when's the next train coming or something like that. So it's one of those things. Uh, I think they're they're very effective at enforcing habits because it adds that level of convenience. You don't have to think about what shortcut do I need to run. You just simply tap your phone, just like you're buying something in a store, but it won't cost you anything. Um, and you know, having these strategically placed uh, around your house or putting them on items like Mike did with the uh, the vitamin bottle, I think is a great idea as well because you know you're going to have that in your hands uh, when you're taking your vitamin and having that that automation that much more accessible really helps. And I, I have one, to your point, I have one next to our um, our washer and dryer up, up high on the wall, uh, on the closet. So I can just scan that and it... Um, I figured over time, I figured out the, what the number on the front actually ends up being for my washer. It says 42 minutes, but it's never 42 minutes. It's always, you know, X, whatever. Um, so I scan that and it, it makes an OmniFocus task um, to switch the laundry in 65 minutes when it's actually going to be done. And, um, and that's really another helpful contextual thing. Like these, these tags cost, like you said, nothing. I think I got like 24 for like six bucks. I, uh, a couple of years ago, they're, they're very easy to, to put all over the house. Um, so as long as my wife doesn't find them, then we're good. One, uh, one question is about kind of, I know you keep track of, uh, re repeating items within OmniFocus. What differentiates one of those from something you would put into streaks and um, the hat or like, and if you're not familiar with streaks, that's a, really great habit tracking up and one I've been using for years. So that's a common question I get. And uh, yeah, just be curious, you know, how you differentiate between the two. I used streaks for a couple of months, uh, maybe, maybe when the pandemic started, I think, but I just, I struggled with, um, with the, the task being in two different places. So streaks fell apart for me. I, it's not, you know, the consecutive thing is, I know, motivating for a lot of people. It's not that motivating for me. Um, so streaks, just the, the extra storage location just didn't, doesn't pay off for me. So everything is in OmniFocus. Uh, I, I use the streaks workout app just because I like the workout. Uh, and it's just made by the same person, which is why it has the same name, but, 
um, everything's in OmniFocus for me, just like all text is in drafts, all all task related things, all, all actions to complete are in OmniFocus. And I know that uh, some people don't work that way because then OmniFocus becomes diluted um, and it becomes not helpful, but for my brain, it just works better to, to do it in OmniFocus. Okay, good. Yeah, the way I differentiate the two is uh, I use streaks for habits that I don't want to rely on any technology to remember. So ones that I want to become ingrained. Um, and then I'll use OmniFocus for repeating actions where I don't even want to have to think about them. I don't, I don't aspire to have them on autopilot. Uh, I just want to be able to look at OmniFocus and say, okay, you need to water the plants. Um, but for something like um, one I developed years ago was getting up in the morning and drinking a glass of water. And, and I don't want to be relying on OmniFocus for that sort of thing. But once it got developed into a habit, it was built in response. I didn't even have to think about it. It was essentially running on autopilot, which is really what, what habits are at the end of the day. There, there's some sort of built in trigger that causes an action. Um, and that doesn't rely on anything external to, to take place. I, I would like to get to that point, but I just don't trust my brain enough to, to ingrain something at this point. So um, I have more, more power to, to people who can, who can do that and to you who can do that. But it's, it hasn't worked out for me yet. Maybe one day, maybe when I grow up, I'll be able to do it. Well, it's definitely a topic I'm planning to cover in more detail on Learn Omni Focus. So uh, yeah, stay tuned for that. Do you just keep sort of committed actions in OmniFocus or do you have some ideas and someday maybe items and things in there as well? Uh, yeah, good question. I didn't go over that. Um, I have a list in drafts of ideas for um, blog posts and for um, you know, videos and stuff like that that I want to do. Um, and one of my last actions on a video production project is to pick the next task to pick the next video. Um, I used to keep everything in OmniFocus as a paused task, um, but then it just, I it became too cluttered and um, then I had to review all of these tasks and that became a problem. So that really made reviews less helpful. So I moved any, my someday maybe is now basically in, in a drafts list somewhere. Um, everything in OmniFocus is something I'm, want to do. And I'll be definitely talking about drafts when we get into the uh, session on ideas in January. So uh, yeah, and talking about some of the use cases that, that Mike just mentioned. Uh, something else that's quite a common question is, uh, does this belong in OmniFocus or in my calendar? Hmm. And what, what do you use as criteria to decide, does it go in one or the other, or maybe in both in some cases? Um. I rarely do both. When I did the forecast tag, when I did the forecast perspective, they became more, they were muddled for me for a little while, like tasks and, and action or tasks and calendar events. But for me now, a, a calendar event is I need to be at a specific location at a specific time. Um, and an action item is I need to do something at a specific time. So sometimes I'll have an action item related to a, an event. Uh, because I'm Google based for my cloud stuff, I, I can use a link and drop the link in the notes and drafts to say like, here's the the pictures that we have to do. And then the action item is, you know, make sure I pay the photographer or something like that. But because action items for me are usually verbs, um, I don't, I don't have too much of a crossover. Okay. And you tend to block off time, kind of make appointments with yourself or you mentioned using a timers as well. Yeah. Kind of I've, your I've done both. Yeah. Um, I like Pomodoro timers. Um, Pomodoro timers are helpful for me to, to get started. Uh, but for the most part now, my, because of how my work schedule works and, and working from home, basically when I wake up in the morning, I go for a walk and when I'm done my walk, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to work until on my to do on my day, sorry, my today list, uh, until my next meeting. Um, so my, I'm just use the voids in my day. Uh, sometimes if there's a big project, I will, um, schedule an appointment with myself just to prevent a calendar, but that's, that has more to do with how, how much of the project I've completed versus when it's due. And if I need to do that, that's like a break break glass in case of emergency type thing. 
for me is to put something on the calendar to block, prevent other people from, from talking to me. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Mike. And if you want to go deeper into this topic, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a session called OmniFocus. There is a course called OmniFocus in the calendar. So you can uh, explore a number of different ways of approaching your relationship between the actions and the calendar, uh, including some of the ones that, that Mike just mentioned. I think uh, the key thing is going back to what Mike said at the very beginning is just learning enough about this that you can actually do something with it. I'm kind of paraphrasing here, Mike, but then then actually dive in and and start to to try out some of these things. And if you go to Mike's blog and YouTube channel, um, he'll give you some some more specific information on these automations. And there's some others that you've got on there as well. So maybe start with something something quite simple, uh, get some of those NFC tags and put it on your bottle of vitamins and just kind of have some fun with it. And then, um, and then build it from there. And that's really, it's not something that happens overnight. I continue to kind of tweak things and come up with new ideas. And I've certainly had some, some great ideas from, from what Mike shared today, uh, especially around using Hazel and, um, and being able to address a specific action within OmniFocus. I think that's really powerful. Um, and uh, yeah, just have some fun with it. And each time you do one of these, these little automations or large automations, it's the, there's a Japanese term called Kaizen, which is continuous improvement. So you're applying that, that practice and you're making your future self's life a little bit easier and, um, you know, giving that extra sort of element to your system that you could, you know, manage without, but why not, you know, have the, the computers do that extra work for us so we can, can really, uh, really spend time on what's most important. Great. I see Andrew asked a question in the chat, project support material. Do you mean where, um, where do I store project support material? Uh, so if it's plain text, like I do all my meeting notes in drafts and if it's, um, something plain text related, I do it in drafts. If it's uh, because I do a lot of um, content creation, like video, PowerPoint, you know, other things like that, I'm a uh, Google Drive um, on the back end uh, for everything. So that's really helpful for me to um, be able to pull that URL and drop it in the OmniFocus notes. Um, the OmniFocus notes app or notes section always has, um, for me, almost always has a URL whether it's a drafts URL, um, if, what am I trying to say? A keyboard maestro URL trigger or, or something like that, or, or, or um, even emails. You can, I didn't realize the URL for emails in Gmail is to that specific email. It's not just your inbox. So you can, I can link pretty much everything into OmniFocus without any issues. I never attach files. I always use URLs. Um, and then Michael said, uh, and files from the outside world. When people send things to me, I end up, um, if it's not a shared document, like um, the work we use, um, Office 365. So I, I'll use those links. I'll, I'll link to Office 365 folders. Um, but if somebody drops me something, I save it to my, um, and something for me to use, like the, the uh, slides for today or something like that. I have it, um, I'll save it to my Google Drive and then link to it from there. Um, when I do video projects and when I do blog posts, part of my automations are to like send that stuff to Google Drive and pull the link from Google Drive and, and link it all that way. Um, but fortunately, I don't receive too many files from the outside world these days anymore. Um, most of it's emails or online link type stuff. This is another area where uh, the Mac app hook can be very useful because you can hook uh, like a folder or a file or pretty much anything to and from OmniFocus. And that's one that I covered in depth in the session or course called Linking OmniFocus. And uh, hook seems to creep into pretty much every session these days because that's, uh, that's just one of the, these kind of magical utilities that, that solves a problem that has existed, I think, for a long time where it's if you're using multiple apps, it can be a little tedious or even impossible to to link them together. And then in many cases, Hook solves that problem. That's one I really want to dig into, but I'm, I'm afraid of uh, 
of op- opening a whole nother world, a whole, whole nother rabbit hole for me to go down, but it seems super powerful and super helpful. Um, do you use OmniFocus as part of your email management? Uh, yeah, Andrew, yes, I do. Uh, one ring to rule them all. There you go. Uh, yeah, I have a video. It's a little bit complicated uh, to just talk through, but I have a video on my YouTube channel about that. Um, you can use the sh- uh, shared services um, or system, what is it called? System services. Uh, mm-hmm. You can create a keyboard shortcut for sending to OmniFocus, and that works from um, mail. So I have a macro, a keyboard maestro macro that opens that, clicks the OK button and sends the, and, and so I basically get a link to an email in OmniFocus. So I click on that and it opens up the email in Apple Mail and I can, I can do what I need to do from there, but it's all, um, again, it's, it's a little bit complicated because you have to set up that that shortcut and then run a couple other things. So it's, I think it's called, uh, I forget what the name of the video is, but it's on my um, YouTube channel on the OmniFocus uh, playlist, managing email with OmniFocus or something like that. And there's also something that David Spark shared a while back. Uh, I use it within Text Expander, but you could certainly use it within something like Keyboard Maestro is I type e-link and mm. I could be anywhere and it just inserts the link to whatever email is selected in the mail app. So there's definitely quite a few different ways to uh, to deal with this issue. That's again where a hook can be very useful. You can just hook a, uh, a mail to, and you can even just invoke hook and you can choose an email and say, open a new OmniFocus action with this with this email, or you could link hook it to an existing one. So, um, but again, that's a great area where, you know, you want to have some linking so that you're not having to go through this tedious process of finding the email that you were referring to in an action or a project or something like that. Hook is one of those apps you can learn the basics in five minutes. And even if that's all you ever learn, that's it's still a very, very useful tool. There's not, you can certainly get into complexities within the app, but you don't have to to get good value from it. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much, Mike, for, mm-hmm. for sharing all your wisdom and automations. I can't wait to kind of be adding some more automations to my uh, my list as well soon too. And definitely go check out uh, Mike's uh, website, themikeburke.com, and you'll find links to uh, YouTube and and Twitter from there. And uh, thanks to all of you for joining here live for all the great great questions and comments. And I hope to see you at uh, some of the upcoming live sessions, including the small group office hours. And if you haven't been to one of those yet, I definitely recommend giving it a try. It's uh, just a really nice way to get a, a feeling of community around uh, OmniFocus and just productivity and life in general. Okay, take care, everybody. Bye for now.